guys, when we get done, this is going to be our end result right here. And this video is quite long. I do understand that. But this is uh, it's just how long it took to go over everything. A lot of the videos out there show you how to, to maybe use Rumi Q Wizard. And that's it. How to take a measurement. They don't tell you how to align subwoofers. They don't tell you how to set a filter, you know, at tuning so you don't mess up your, your driver or your subwoofer. They don't tell you how to align one sub to another and what you're looking for and how to get seat to seat consistency. So we're going to cover a lot in this video. We're going to cover all of those things. We're going to cover filters, you know, and where to set your filters and how to do the EQ. And REW basically has an auto EQ function that most people don't even realize it does. And we're going to go over how it compares to the Behringer or the iNuke DSP. So while it is long and some of you guys may maybe you already know some of this stuff or you know but just there's going to be a lot of information here so uh just kind of bear with me all right guys so if y'all are ready to learn about roomy q wizard and how to get your sub set up and aligned let's get it done okay one very important thing you're going to have to do before you start this is gain match your subs now this is not SPL matching where you sit in your seat and you just measure the subs where they you know, are in the room because all you're doing is measuring room modes and you're going to have some subs working a lot harder than others. We're going to take the room out of the equation basically so all subs are working equally as hard. So for that video, just click the link right above, go watch it, it's not too long and then come back and finish this. Welcome everyone, this is episode 7 of Home Theater Gurus. So as you see, we have the mini DSP page in front of us, so I'm sure most of you or many of you know what that means. Today, we're going to be aligning or measuring and aligning subwoofers. So we're going to need a few things, or you're going to need a few things, to do this. The first thing you're going to need is a microphone, a way to take measurements, and we're going to be using Rumi Q Wizard to take those measurements but you're going to need a mic so if you go to this mini dsp page there's a really good mic that's really popular called the u mic one and here it is here just go to products u mic one and you'll see it's 75 dollars now for about another 25 dollars you can go to cross spectrum labs and get this individually calibrated or get one that has an individual cal file these mics here for mini DSP are calibrated in batches and so what that means they'll produce you know a given amount of mics and they'll kind of average out the calibration file that all of them need now so it's not going to be tailored or you know, to any individual mic so it's not going to be nearly as accurate as what cross spectrum does where they actually create a cal file for that individual mic so for another $25 I highly recommend going over to uh, to their website and ordering from them that's cross spectrum labs okay so you're gonna need your mic so let's say you get it here from mini DSP now to get that batch file calibration or cal, cal file you'll go down and you'll enter a serial number now the serial number is going to be on your microphone now the way they put the mic or the uh, sticker kind of in a bad spot in the stand will actually rub it off of your mic so I take a magic or a sharpie magic marker and actually write it on the skinny part of your microphone you know like write it right here because that's your serial number right there and it's really hard to see I don't, I'm not a fan of that so uh, anyway yeah go ahead and do that with the magic marker here right there serial number because just in case you change computers or you lose your cal file you can always put it right here hit submit and it's going to give you two files. One's going to be a zero degree, one's going to be a 90 degree. The zero degree is when your mic is horizontally positioned, like if you're measuring a loudspeaker, if you're like designing loudspeakers or something like that. And we're going to be using it at the 90 degree. It's going to be pointing straight up. But now keep in mind, we're going to be measuring subwoofers, 80 hertz, one cycle is 13 feet long. It doesn't care what position this mic is facing or what cal file we use, it's going to work just fine with either of the files but we're going to use 90 just because that's the orientation that the mic's going to be in just for good practice okay so that's going to take care of our mic and now we're going to need some type of EQ now some of you may have an iNuke with DSP or your Behringer with DSP 
and those are fine they do work well but you're going to see in a little while why I highly recommend the mini DSP it's just so much easier much more user friendly a lot faster when it comes to loading EQ filters it can be done in seconds on a mini DSP versus several minutes per channel depending on how fast you are at uh, with the Behringer's all right so now we need some more we need a uh, mini DSP so you've got a couple different choices you have the standard mini DSP right here and ninety five dollars it's really good it uh, it's limited with seven milliseconds of delay and that's kind of its crutch because it's very possible that you're gonna need more than seven milliseconds when you're aligning your subs and if you need more than that this is pretty much a doorstop so and uh, also the resolution or the EQ resolution is not nearly as good as the HD which is what I'm gonna recommend which is the 2x4 HD on this one after you put the EQ file in you're gonna have to go back and massage that response quite a bit to get it to look like you want whereas with the HD version you know usually you don't have to touch it up at all and if you do it may just be one or two little filters and you're you know it's much much quicker and also the HD well let's go ahead and look at the HD Oh, before we go to the HD the balanced the balanced is basically the same as the standard it just accepts balanced inputs again I've got this one actually but it's also limited with by uh, seven milliseconds of delay so it's not really a great choice either and here is the 2x4 HD this is the one with the high resolution it also has the ability to save several different uh, EQ files or you know like you can select them they have an optional remote I think you can get it right here Iowa remote you can get it right here for five dollars pretty cheap and you can select different house curves on the fly so it, it's pretty neat it's got the resolution is really really good uh, the delay is over 80 milliseconds so a ton of delay it does cost more it's twice the price and uh, you also have to get the plug-in which is going to be ten dollars sometimes you can go on Amazon and find these uh find a deal with uh, Amazon Prime for 200 I think I found one for 201 205 something like that with the free plug-in so that was you know saves you a little bit but this is the one I recommend all right and that's the one we're going to be using today so after you get your EQ you need to come and you've got to get your plug-in so let's see Here we go, audio plugins. Couldn't find it. All right, so if you have a standard 2x4, you're going to come, or if you had the balanced, which is also basically standard 2x4, you're going to use the 2x4 advanced plugin. So this is the one you're going to get. And I actually like the layout of the 2x4 or the advanced plugin better than the HD plugin. I just like the way it's laid out, it just looks nicer to me. But we're going to be using the I can't find my way here. Here we go. We're going to be using the HD, the 2x4 HD. So this is the one we would download. And when you download this, you basically follow the instructions, and it's going to ask you if you want, if you're on a Mac or PC, and you're going to extract, and you know, it's kind of self-explanatory. It'll walk you right through it, and it'll put a, a a shortcut on your desktop for you. All right. Before we leave, I do want to look at one thing: the 4x10 HD. I've had a couple guys, you know, that have purchased this thinking that, you know, it's an HD. It's got the resolution of the HD, but it doesn't. And it doesn't have the delay either. It only has 9 milliseconds of, de of delay versus 7 on the regular. And it's also, its resolution is not nearly, you know, it's basically like a standard mini DSP. I'm not sure why they give it the HD label. It's not nearly as uh, high in resolution. Like, again, 9 milliseconds of delay. I would stay away from it because it's five hundred dollars and for four hundred dollars you can get two of the mini DSP two by four HDs and you've got eight outputs and it's gonna take up less room because this is to fit into a 19 inch rack I mean those mini DSPs are the size you know the two by fours are as big as a deck of cards maybe a tad bit bigger the tiny very easy to hide and they're kinda of out of the way and you forget they're there they just do their thing okay so that's gonna be it from the mini DSP page and all you're going to need to hook them up, you know, if you come over here to the 2x4 HD and they're just the standard 2x4 is the same way, you're just going to come out of your receiver or your processor 
and here's your input, input for channel one and input for channel two. You're just going to go into one of these. We're not going to use both, even if your receiver or processor has two sub outs, we're going to use one sub out only. Okay, we don't want our receiver to have the ability to mess up anything that we're going to do in this little puppy here. So one RCA cable in, and then you're going to have four outputs on this other end. Here you can see them right here. Let's click on them. There we go. Here's the four outs. So you can handle four subwoofers, basically, or four sublocations with this little puppy right here. It's a really neat little tool. Okay, so that's going to be it from that page. Then you're going to go to avnirvana.com and you're going to click on forms you're going to scroll down just a little bit and we're going to see REW Rumi Q wizard support form you're going to click on it <clears throat> okay now you're going to the third one down it may not be the third one down if you know a week from now I don't know but you're going to look for this REW beta release. This is where all the downloads are located. So click on it. The first thing you're going to see, there's only one post on here, I guess it's locked. Download section. You're going to click on downloads. And here they all are. Now I updated uh, yesterday because I knew I was going to be making this video and I haven't updated this thing in years. So I was running an old version. So some of the stuff is a little bit different to me. I'm not used to seeing it. But a lot of the guys I've helped online, you know, they're using a the new version. So I, I, you know, I'm aware of some of the differences. We're kind of new about them ahead of time. They're not too big. It's small differences, but they're there. So this is the one you're going to use, the newest version. And if I was logged in right here, you would see a download button. So you would download it, and it's going to walk you through it. And it's going to put a link on your desktop for you. All right, or a shortcut. Okay, so that's REW. Now, most of the people I help have problems with this. This is a major headache for them, and they hate this word, ASIO for all. This allows you to, it's basically a, a driver you're going to install in REW, and it allows you to ping or sweep any channel in 7.1. And the point one, of course, is the sub-channel. So it just makes it really, really easy to, you know, mess with any speaker in the room without even getting out of your chair. And I had it working perfectly on my old version. Didn't really have any problems with it at all, never. And uh, so I guess I didn't really understand why people were having so many problems doing this, you know, in the past year or two until I updated because I, you know, I need to be on the new update of REW for this here. I updated it and ASIO wouldn't work. I was running an old version prior to 2015 because like I said, it was old. So I updated ASIO as well, opened REW, and it worked. It had all eight channels. And then four segments later, it crashed. REW was down, had to open it back up, and then I couldn't get it to work again. So we're just going to say screw this because we don't really need ASIO for what we're doing at all. There's a trick, a little workaround, and I'm going to show you all that or explain to you what to do to work around it. So a lot of y'all are going to be happy that you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so let's go ahead and open REW. Now, um, for your mic and, uh, you know, to, to be able to use a laptop, say like at your seat, you're going to need most of this stuff at your seat. You can get like a long HDMI cable, you know, 20 feet or something like that. That's what I have here. And you can actually go on Amazon and get USB extensions. And I have a couple of those. And that way, you know, you can move your your mic around without having you know to move your laptop around with it and also you know to connect to your mini DSP which is probably somewhere next to your sub amp you know and uh, you know it gives you a lot of flexibility and you can sit in your chair and not have to you know worry about being close to the equipment so they're real cheap USB extension cables alright so this is REW now it may pop up and recognize the mini DSP if it's plugged in already. I think I opened it earlier, so that's probably why it didn't pop up this time. And it's going to ask you if you want to use it, and you'll hit yes. All right, so we're going to, we need to go to preferences. Now, there's two ways to do it. You can go here, hit preferences, or you can just go to this little wrench. It opens the same window. All right, now, if you're going to use ASIO for all, 
you'll click here, ASIO. Okay. All right, guys. Now, I was going to show you all how to get in here to ASIO and set it up. But when I did, I'm um, using a mic here to talk to you all through my laptop. And uh, the program that's, that's copying the screen and recording the screen, it uh, acted up and shut down. So I'm not going to be able to do ASIO and show you how to use it. But we're not going to be using it today anyway. So we're going to use Java. Default device is going to be Marantz. That's the or whatever you're using, whatever receiver or processor you have, you're going to select that as your output device. Input device is going to be the U mic. Okay, that's our microphone. Okay, don't forget to click on Cal files. We have to load our calibration files that we either got from any DSP site or you know if we uh, got one from Cross Spectrum Labs, we would enter those here. If you're using ISIO for all, you would put it here. Then here is the Java, which we're going to be using the Java, just the regular uh, default option today. You all enter it here, and you see I've already selected it 90 degrees. Just hit this browse button and go find it wherever you know wherever you put it, and uh, double click, and it'll load up, and you're good to go. Now we're going to come over here, and we're going to do uh, where was it at? Check levels, okay. Now, if you uh, it doesn't show it, it's going to tell you what the levels need to be down here once we get there. Let's see, here we go. Um, USB mic, they need to be between 30 or negative 30 and negative 50. Now, that's going to be right here on the end. So, so let's try this again. Okay, there we go. Didn't work a second ago, but now it's working. Okay, we're at 44 for our N. And we're supposed to be between 30 and 50, so we are good. Uh, hit finish. Okay, now let's go ahead and close this. Now we're basically ready to take a measurement. Well, no, we're not ready just yet. We need to go into our, let's see, where's my bottom drawer here? There we go. We need to get into the mini DSP and take a look in there. Now when you get this, it's going to have a lot of default settings and we're going to have to go in there and tell it what we want it to do. Like when you get it, when it's brand new, it's probably going to look like this. Now this means input one and these are your outputs. Okay, we don't have anything on the uh, input two. So we're going to turn all those off. We got four subs, so when we get done, they're all going to be on. They're all going to be yellow like this. And this, like zero dB, is like if you have any uh, if you have any gain that you uh, on the output side that you boost you'll see it here like it's got a little bit of boost on the output or something like that that's all that is all right let's hit connect I see we're not connected okay, you can minimize this but don't exit out Okay, let's hit uh, Restore Config. Now you don't have to hit that. I'm just hitting that because it's going to put it like it was when it was brand new. Okay, <clears throat> again, we're going to untoggle those. Turn on the sub outputs we're going to be using. Now go to, just make sure there's no PEQ. We don't want any EQ. If there was EQ, you would see wiggles on this line here. We want everything to be nice and uh, just raw. We want raw responses. Most of the stuff is going to be on the output. So hit our output, PEQ. Now, like I said, I just pretty much set it to default, so everything's going to be blank. So everything, you see everything's blank. Now crossover, you're going to have to check this. A lot of guys will have like no output on like channel 3 and 4, and they're not sure what it, the problem is. And here's the problem. See, channel one, it's, this is set up for like a loudspeaker, like where you have a sub or a woofer, and channel two is being used for the, uh, the tweeter or the highs. So it's set up in like crossover mode. So we need to get rid of that. And that's why you can't get, you will not get any subwoofer information on three, I mean, I'm sorry, on two, because two is set to roll it all off here at like, what, a thousand hertz or something. Yeah, a thousand hertz. All right, so we're going to bypass it. And that's what we want to see. We want to see a nice yellow line all the way across. 
whatever comes in is going to go out basically okay and go up here and hit select channel hit output two and it's going to link those two together so whatever you do to one you're going to see on both see watch this see crossover and there it is because we just set it on output one we linked it to output two now go into output three hit crossover and see now this one's set up as sub here we just let's look at this real quick see that one's set up as the tweeter woofer tweeter all right so we're going to go ahead and bypass it and again nice straight line that's what we want we're going to hit select channel we're going to sync it up with output two or i'm sorry three hit link and we just link those two channels together so now let's go back to three and confirm and there we go all right so now there is no peq and there's no filters in our mini dsp so we're good to go there now also you need to make sure that you have turned off any odyssey or any type of room correction that also needs to be disengaged now the workaround don't x this out just minimize it the workaround for uh not using ASIO is we're going to have to jack up our crossover in our receiver. Our crossover is normally going to be set like say 80 hertz. So we're going to be sweeping our mains, like our right or left main. So you need to go into your receiver, set it to small, set the mains to small, and set that crossover up as high as it'll go. Mine goes up to 250 in the Marant here. And that's going to be our, our workaround because now when we sweep our mains, anything below 250 is going to go straight to our sub. And that's, that's all we need. We're good to go. All right. Let's go ahead and take a measurement. Well, I don't know why my bottom tray is not popping up. We need to turn some subs on and off. Okay, go back to input and routing. Let's go. Let's have a sub one playing by itself real quick. Okay. Just hit continue anyway if you see this. All right. Now here is where we're going to set our range. Now the LFE channel, which is the point one, it goes up to 120 hertz. I've already set it because I was on here yesterday. And we're going to go down to 10 hertz because I really don't care to go any lower. So that's the span we're going to be measuring. Now, of course, if you're doing a loudspeaker, you may have this at 20,000 hertz. And over here, you have the length. And this is like 250. This is resolution, basically. You can turn it up to 512, and you'll double your time of the sweep to 10.9 seconds. But 5.5 seconds is plenty of time to get a good high-resolution measurement. From, you know, we're only going 10 to 120 hertz. All right, so it's not fitting on our graph the way we want. So the first thing we need to do is go over here to limits. Okay, now you see it's set for 10 hertz to 120 hertz, which is actually what we want. And I set this up yesterday. That's why it's already here. It's, you know, I didn't just get lucky. This could be 20,000 or whatever when you click it. You know, maybe it's set up for a loudspeaker full, you know, full range. So just set it for what you want to actually see. Hit apply settings. And there we go. Just hit this right here. These two little arrows will move uh, the graph up and down. And you can also come over here to limits. Like if uh, your graph isn't set the way you want it. Oh, just in case someone's not familiar with the graph, the bottom down here is going to be the frequency. Here's 10 hertz and 20 hertz and 30 hertz, all the way up to 120, which is where we stop measuring. And then this is going to be how loud it is, our dB. So, and you want to make sure that you see 5 dB increments. You don't want to see 10 or 20, then 30, then 40. You want to see 20, 25, 30, 35. Okay, now we can come over here to limits. And we can change all of this. We can change the left side, the hertz, or the upper side. All right, so that is sub one. That's at the main listening position. So let's go ahead and look at what one subwoofer looks like across, say, a couch. So I'm going to move it about 18 inches over to the left. And I'm going to get a measurement. All 
Now this is about 18 inches. This is not very far. All right. Let's go ahead and go about three feet over. So this is 18 inches to the right of the first measurement. I'm going to try to just get a span of about a full size, you know, three cushion couch. And we're looking at one sub. All right. Let's go ahead and move it over. Go about two feet now. So I'm, uh, I'm probably five. I'm probably about six feet actually from the first measurement that was all the way on the other side of me on the left side of the couch now we're all the way on the right okay do you see what's happening here so everyone's sitting on this couch and say it's a three cushion couch below 30 hertz they're hearing about the same thing but everything above this they're hearing something totally different now this is also why the crawl method doesn't work. If you're, you know, you got the sub at, you know, at one seat and the base is, you know, hitting at 30 hertz, this seat in green is going to sound great. You know, and the other two, I'm not going to have near as much bass. And this seat in blue is going to have like, you know, it's, he's over there just doesn't know what everyone else is smiling about. You know, because uh, when you're doing the sub crawl, you're just listening for peaks is all you can do. You, you cannot hear any of the nulls. You don't even know they're there. You know, so measurements, uh, they're far superior. You really have no clue. You're blind with the subcrawl. And uh, anyway, there's lots of variation in these seats. So that's what we're going to try to remedy here. All right. Now, in an open room, like a living room, this would actually look a lot worse. One sub at several seats. But my theater is very, very symmetrical. I'm not sitting, you know, my seats were placed specifically to stay out of room modes as much as possible. So even with one sub, this actually looks pretty good. You know, most of the of you guys are going to have measurements of one sub that are going to be far, you know, greater or a lot more variation than this right here. But I mean, you know, the distance and the difference in this right here is, you know, we got 5, 10, 15, we're 18 dB of difference between this point at 41 hertz in this one here so I mean there is a ton of variation you know we've got 10 dB right here this you know every response every seats hearing just something totally different every seats hearing a different response getting a different experience okay so let's go ahead and start aligning some subwoofers because we have four subwoofers in this room one in every corner this was just an example just to show you the what to expect with one sub again in a very well set up room and we're going to save this because I want to come back to it in a little while this is going to be one let's call it one sub and sofa okay one sub sofa all right ah, I'm going to do it again All right, one sub sofa. All right, now we're going to close all these. And the mic, I'm going to put it back at the main listening position. Okay. So we're already looking at the left front sub. So let's go ahead and do, go and get its measurement again. And if you've seen the Harmon studies, you know, like the front corners are good spots, you know, for subwoofers. Uh, opposing front and rear corners are good. One quarter and three quarter on the front wall are all good. And these are good for room smoothing, you know, applications or trying to smooth out your, you know, your seat to seat consistency. So let's go ahead and turn on the right rear sub since this is the front left sub. Let's do right rear. I don't, I don't know why my little window is not popped up in front of my huh, windows here. Okay, let's turn on, I think, sub four. 
is the back right. So let's turn off sub one because we need to get a measurement of sub four by itself so we can align it to sub one. Okay, so this is sub four, the back right corner, and this is the front left corner sub. Now when you're placing subs, another reason the sub crawl doesn't work with multiple subs, if you see, I think I can highlight it here in yellow, let's see, yeah, see it's highlighted there in yellow, that's sub one. You see it's got issues up in here, you know, it's it needs a little help, it's a little low. Then sub two, you know, it's under 20 hertz, it's losing a lot of output, so it needs some help there too. I don't really have any big dips or nulls, but say there was a huge null here, you know, that second sub needs to have extra output there to bring it up. And that's the, another point of having two subwoofers is to fix the issues the other subwoofer has. So we can actually place or sit in a null with a subwoofer and use a second subwoofer to fix it. So the thinking that you cannot sit in a null is absolutely false. You can sit in it and just use another subwoofer to fix it. Very, very easy to do. So you he see here, they're both helping each other out. They're going to help each other out great very nicely where you know this one needs help this one's here to pitch in and vice versa so when we sum these we should get a really nice response that response should you know that when you sum two subwoofers you want a positive summation which means the summed response should not dip below either one of the individual responses anywhere ideally so you know our sum response should be up here and it should look really nice. Now we're not worried about flat right now, we're worried about a positive summation. So let's go ahead and start aligning these subwoofers. All right. <clears throat> so let's turn on output 1 and two, uh, 4 at the same time. So now we have their individual responses and we're going to need that information and we need to keep it on the screen. Okay. So now that we've got 1 and 4 turned on at the same time, let's get their measurement. Now it's going to be above that line, so I'm going to go ahead and roll it up. Now, if you see this, let's hit limits again. If you see this right here, you're on the wrong tab, you need to hit all SPL. Okay, and that's going to show us all the measurements on the same screen. So let's go ahead and measure them together. And look what happened. We have two subs and the response is actually worse than any one of those individual subs. Basically we've lost output. You know, we've gained in some places, but overall we have a you know really nasty looking response. So we need to align them. So let's go ahead and start aligning our subwoofer. Subwoofers. So let's go ahead and I don't know, I think I closed the mini DSP tool. Let me open it back up. Okay, and then connect again. All right, so we need to go to outputs. And what you're going to do is you're going to add delay to the closer sub. So my front sub, you know, I'm probably 14 feet from it, 15 feet. My rear sub, I'm maybe 6 feet from it. So we're going to add delay to the rear sub. So let's go right here and we're gonna this is where you add your delay. Let's go ahead and put a five right there. Well, not fifth, not oh five. Let's just put five, hit enter, to make sure it loads. Now you may not have to hit enter, but uh, it seems like uh, maybe on the other version you did, maybe this one you don't you don't, but I'm just gonna hit it just to make sure. Oh come on. Uh, I'm going to have to minimize each one. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and see how it looks now. We've added delay to the closer sub. Let's see how our response has changed. And looky there, it's actually a lot better. This is with no delay, and this is with uh, what, four or five milliseconds of delay. 
And this is basically what you're going to do. You're going to keep adding delay until you find a positive summation. You see, we're still dipping below our individual response, which is that light blue line. That's one of our measurements. And it's still getting below there in some places. You know, up in here, it's below it a little bit. You know, overall, it's pretty good. But that's our goal is to get the most positive summation we can. So let's go ahead and try a little more delay. Let's see what happens. Let's put in seven. Okay. Let's go ahead and measure. All right, now that's the blue line. See, we're, now over here, we're below our green line a little bit, so we're not quite, you know, the output's not as good. We're still well below, above our individual responses. So overall, that looks pretty, looks really good. Let's see if we can do a little better. Let's try nine. Now, sometimes, remember, you have 80 milliseconds here. I mean, you can jump around five milliseconds at a time, and you're just looking for a spot where it looks promising. You can go back to it and really kind of tweak on it. It can be a very long process. Okay, now that was this one. Now you see above 70 hertz, it's starting to lose output. So we were probably better a minute ago, or a few seconds ago, at 7. Now, this sub is behind us. And, you know, a lot of you have heard if it's behind you, you need to invert it. So we can go ahead and try that. Now, that's not always the case. You know, you need to confirm via measurement, but we're going to try it. Man, looky there. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. We're zoomed out a little too much. Hit that plus right there and you can zoom in. See that inverting at zero? I've got really good output. I'm not really losing anything. I mean, that green one was a little bit better right here. But overall, I've got more output there now. Below 15 hertz, I am losing output going with this one. But above there I'm doing just fine and I'm actually gonna put a filter at 15 Hertz so I don't really care about that so that's actually that's where I'm gonna leave it so if I had these two subs and these are the only subs in the room I'm done right there okay now I just remeasured these because I accidentally X'd out the wrong one but those are our two individual measurements let's make those a little bit darker oh that's pretty good okay that's our two individual measurements sub 1 and sub 4 and combined we get that so that's actually really good we would actually be done right now if we were going to if that's the only two subs we had in the room we would be done right now with alignment they would be aligned the only thing left to do would be the EQ now if we we're going to add a third sub we would need to just continue on. Okay, these two subs, the individual sub responses, would go away. They no longer exist because now this combined sub response is our single sub. We're going to treat it as a single sub, as a unit, like a sub team. So they will never, never again be treated as an individual sub once they're added to this sub response or at once they're combined. So then we would just take our third sub, we would get an individual measurement of it, and uh, start aligning, which we're fixing to do. Now I do want to say something. A while ago, whenever we, you know, we looked at our sub one was say 15 feet away, the sub two was six feet away, you know, and I just chose like five, I chose five milliseconds to start. That was kind of a baseline. You know, if you know one sub is five or six feet further from you from the other one, you can just start every uh, foot 
is a millisecond basically. So if it's five feet, you know, the difference in the two, one, you know, say one's 10 and one's 15, that's five, you know, feet of difference. So you can start with five milliseconds. But now that you have some two subs together, you create what is called a, like a virtual sub in the room. It's somewhere out in the room. It's between the two subs that you've aligned. You add a third sub. Now the virtual sub is somewhere between the, all three of those subs. So you can only use that trick, you know, where you use the difference in, you know, uh, distance on the first two subs. After that, when you're adding the third one, you're basically just, just going to start hunting. So just uh, kind of let that be known. All right. Now, because this is my room and I have four subs, I'm going to go ahead. I already know what my sub, my room needs because it's my room. Okay, we've got four subs. Let's go ahead and we're going to measure each one individually real quick. And then I'm going to line them really quick so we can get to EQ. Now, in an irregular room, living room, something that's open, this would take much longer. Okay, it's kind of not fair for me to show y'all how easy it's going to be to align this room, but you have to remember I designed it, you know, my seating is perfect, or pretty perfect. I mean, uh, sub placement is perfect. The room is a, you know, a nice rectangle room. It's, everything was really well designed, and I used the Harmon studies to place the subs, so it makes it almost too easy. It's not going to be this easy for most people. Especially if you have an open room. Now those are the two front subs. Notice how similar they are. Okay, let's go ahead and keep on going. Well, you know what? Okay, since we're going to do the first front, the front two subs first, we already have their individual responses. Let's turn on one and two, and let's go ahead and align them. So now let's see what they look like combined. I just turned both of them on. Bam. Now that is pretty awesome. If you look at that, I have a great summation with no delay needed. Now that's because my room is so symmetrical. Now if you have a bedroom, something that's a nice square, you know, a rectangle, and uh, you know, you don't have furniture next to one sub, I mean, if it's really symmetrical, you're going to get this too. Okay. This is just what happens with a really symmetrical setup. The subs in each corner, the subs at one quarter and three quarters, it's going to be real easy. Where you get a difficult time is when you start having a lot of furniture that's irregular. It's not, you know, it's stuff on one side of the room. It's not on the other. Uh, doorways, openings, you know, have some irregularity in the rear of my room because I have an opening on the right, but it's still not too bad. All right. So one and two are done. So I'm going to actually close one and two individual responses because all I need is this combined response. Now this is going to be treated as a single sub like I said before that's one and two combined so now I need to add three so we need to toggle these two off because we need an individual measurement of three okay so we have our individual measurement of three in the blue and the purple is our combined measurement of one and two so now we need to turn one two and three on and see how they sum now three is the back or the uh, rear left sub All right, let's change the color here. Let's go with red. Okay, a lot of negative summation. And you see, when subs are not in phase, you can actually get nulls that don't even exist in the individual measurements. So 
not only is it difficult by ear or basically impossible to properly place them unless the room is symmetrical and you, you can use like the Harmon studies and Rumo calculators, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be very hard to place them, but you also can't even align them. You're not going to know, you know, you may have some extra output here at 30 Hertz. You're listening to music and you think you've aligned it because you have more output here and there could be a sharp null somewhere else being, you know, due to it because they're out of phase. They're not, or they're not aligned. So that's not going to work, but instead of, uh, you know, the pain of y'all watching me go through this, like I said, this is my room, so I already know what it needs. It needs to be inverted, and I don't even have to add delay. I can add delay and actually get it close without even inverting it, but this right here, just pretty much, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be really good. And like I said, don't expect this in most of your rooms. It's not going to happen this easy. Placement and some of it is luck. Okay, it's that nice red one up there. Let's change the color. And we change it to purple. I need something better than that. Green. We don't have green yet. Okay, so as you see, nice summation. We've gained a lot of output and that, let's go ahead and toggle it off. This, uh, let's see, this red one here, that's what we had before. And then we inverted it and we got this. So now we are good. We still have a little nega summation at 12 hertz, which I could care less at 12 hertz because I'm going to be filtering it before that. I don't want anything at 12 hertz because I really don't like anything that low. A lot of people do, and it's perfectly fine. You know, it's a hobby. Some people, you know, like to damage the house or, you know, some people just like a lot of bass. You know, that's their thing. They're into it and that is perfectly fine. And it is an experience that most people will never, you know, get to experience to listen to something, you know, 30 hertz at 140 dB, which some of you guys out there and you know who I'm talking about have rooms that can do it and systems that can do it. And I, you know, it's got to be just insane and I would love to experience it but in my room it's just not something I'm looking for so because we now have a summed response of all three subs we can get rid of all these other responses because they no longer matter as far as we're concerned we've got one sub in the room even though it's a combination of three and that's our one single sub system so now we're going to go ahead and align sub four to it so we need to get a response of sub four. We need to turn all the other, the other three subs off, turn sub four on, and measure again. Okay. And we've gained a lot of output. See how much higher we are with the other three subs. Okay, so that's sub four. Now this one's kind of close to the opening on the right. So it's, you know, it's responses and all that great, but a lot of it has to do with the opening there. So let's go ahead and turn it on so we can see what it looks like all together. And we have a lot of negative summation. And you're always going to be working with two, two raw responses. You're always going to be working with either sub 1 and sub 2, or you're going to be working with your combined subs and the sub you're adding. Always. Always two responses, and then you're going to be looking at how the combined response, when you, the, the combination of the new sub you're adding to the group, you're going to be looking at how its response is comparing because you want it to always have positive summation you don't want negative because it's actually taking away from having an extra subwoofer you're losing output and you're going to be hurting your seat to seat consistency which we'll look at in a little while so like I said this is my room I know what it needs inverted and I almost hate to do this or to show you guys this because it's not this easy it shouldn't be this easy. 
it's just the way my, you know, like I said, it's just my room. <clears throat> All the guys that I've helped over the years are probably going to see this and be mad because when I've had to help them, it was never this easy. And, uh, yeah, it's not fair. So anyway, again, 14 hertz. That's where we start getting negative summation. Again, I don't care. Great positive summation everywhere else. I mean, it looks fantastic. Now, I could go in there and mess with the delay and bring this up, but I would lose a little bit of output in other places. And be, again, I'm filtering off right here. And, you know, if you look right here, this sub is losing output right here. So, I mean, it's not really going to help down here anyway. No matter what I do. But some of the other subs may have if I had tweaked them. Maybe, you know, I could have got a little more output down low. But, like I said, I'm going to be putting a filter there. So, the last response is our combined sub. So, that's it. That right there is our sub. Our sub system. So, okay, let's go ahead and do EQ. Actually, let's go ahead and take a break. Alright guys, I just took a little break. And uh, my room has like an entry room off to the side. And my theater is actually open to that entry room. And my door was open. And, and now it's closed. And uh, that will make an effect or a difference, especially down low. So let's just see how it looks with the door open versus the door closed. Let's go ahead and measure with the door closed. I mean, not a lot, but I mean, if you look, we picked up quite a bit at 13 hertz. I mean, that's, you know, 96 dB, eh, you know, 2 dB or so. Anyway, not a big deal. Just something to kind of be aware of. Okay. Before we uh, get into EQ, let's go ahead and take some measurements and uh, look at the similarity seat to seat after we aligned our subwoofers. Okay, that was the far left seat. I'm going to go a couple feet over towards the middle. This will be like the middle of the couch. I'm going to move over to the other side, the far, well, the opposite side, far left. All right, so now you see that all the seats are extremely similar. I mean, the difference in this and this is what do we have 98, 96.77, 98.5. So, not even quite 2 dB of difference from one side of the couch to the other. So, that's going to be an, a very, very similar seat. And see, here's the middle seat right here. So, this is the main listening position. So, I mean, really. You know, this whole area, every seat is 1 dB, you know, uh, difference. Everything's nice and tight. We're probably plus or minus, you know, a dB and a half from, from the middle position. Now, over here, it gets a little bit, you know, iffy. Now, this seat over here is next to an uh, entryway, so that's why it kind of gets a little squirrely, you know, a little less similar because that entryway, that opening is affecting it a little bit. But if you remember what it looked like before, let's see, open measurement, one sub sofa. So that's what it looked like before, before we aligned them. And this was at the same volume level. I didn't touch the volume of the receiver. This is, that's how much output we've gained 
just by aligning the subs and you'll notice our seat to seat consistency so this is a uh, an, an awesome example of proper alignment we gained a ton of output and we gained a ton of seat to seat consistency so some of you guys out there that have two subs maybe they're not aligned just right you know maybe you have four subs they're not aligned just right you think you need more subs you know your subs are possibly just not outputting or not playing as well as they should because you saw when you align subs and they're not properly aligned you actually get negative summation you can lose output so uh, just kind of be aware aware of that all right so let's go ahead and collapse all of this or close all these let's go ahead and EQ so the first thing we need to do is get a raw measurement Now, when I say raw measurement, that of course means no EQ on it. You know, this is an un-EQ'd response, but it is an aligned response. So we've already done our alignment, and the mic is at our main listening position. So there's our response. We're going to hit EQ. Okay, so when you open it, it's going to look like this. And the first thing we have to do is select our EQ. And if you have any of these EQs up here, you're in luck because they will all accept a mini DSP file. Unfortunately, for some reason, the iNukes are not. I, I really don't know why they're not, because they're definitely more popular than some of the other ones on here. But they're not. So, you know, if you have a standard mini DSP, you're going to select that. We're using a 2x4 HD. And I'm going to show you, after we create these filters, uh, what you would do if you had an iNuke. Alright, then we're going to go to target settings. Now of course, yes it's the subwoofer. If you're doing a full range speaker, you can also do full range speakers. So bass management cutoff, uh, we want this well above our subwoofer range. I mean I've got it at 850, 400, you know, just something well above our subwoofer range. We do not want to cut anything anything off in the upper level. Bass management, okay, you can skip all this. Uh, we'll come back to low frequency cutoff in a minute. If this is not checked, go ahead and check it. So those of you that have helped know how I set up my house curve or the uh, these options here. Low frequency start, I'm going to put it at 100. Low frequency rise end, I'm going to put it at 30. And we're going to set this up to where you can easily adjust your target from flat to a house curve. Now this blue line is your target here. That's what we're going to EQ to. And if you see this up here, this low frequency cutoff, you can adjust it and it will decrease or increase or flatten the lower end. All right. So if we want it to go with a flat response, we would just bring this down to zero. If we wanted to increase it, we would bring it up. So why would we want to bring it up? Well, if you've ever heard of loudness compensation or like dynamic EQ that uh, Odyssey has, it works on this principle here. If you're at reference or at zero after you've calibrated your receiver, a flat response sounds natural. If you were to play 30 hertz, a 30 hertz tone, tone and an 80 hertz tone, they would sound about the same loudness or the same level. But most people don't listen to reference. Reference is very, very loud. For, you know, even in a treated room that's well treated, it's still pretty darn loud. Most people, you know, maybe negative 15, negative 20 is probably the most popular, you know, the average listening levels from, you know, that I've seen online when people compare their levels. So when you're at, say, negative 20, if you play a 30 hertz tone and then you go and play an 80 hertz tone, you're going to notice that that 30 hertz needs to be boosted 8 to 10 dB to sound as loud as 80 hertz. It's just the way our ears perceive low frequencies. So... You know, Odyssey and Yamaha, they know this, so they have loudness compensation software in their receivers. And it works really nice, like uh, with Odyssey's Dynamic EQ, it's like a, a live house curve. The closer you get to reference, the more it backs off the boosting. And the further away you get to, from it, it increases it. Now, they do have an offset where you can kind of adjust that, like if you say at negative 20, it's too much. You can go in there and set the offset from 0 to negative 5, and it'll back it down 5. Anyway, so that's the concept. So in this room, I have an older receiver. It's a Marantz 7009. 
doesn't have the new Odyssey app that allows you to limit EQ because I don't want to EQ above the motor region or above, you know, say 300 hertz where, you know, the room becomes uh, modal. You know, above that, that's where all the reflections are at. But my room is well treated to have really good speakers and I don't want to EQ my loudspeakers for, you know, based on a small bubble for issues that may not even exist in other seats. I have seven seats in here. So I don't want to use full range EQ, which Odyssey, the older versions, forced you to do. So I use no EQ on my loudspeakers and use a house curve, a manual house curve on my subs because you do need a house curve. I've had guys come to me thinking they need, you know, new subs and want me to design them a sub. And before we did that, I said, well, let's look at your response. We look at their response and their response is flat. And of course, they're not listening to reference and like, you know, I just tell them that's your problem. You probably don't need new subs. And we'll go in and put a house curve and they're happy. They don't, you know, they realize they didn't need new subs all along. They were just reading, you know, these people online, you know, this sub is the biggest and baddest ever. All along, what they had was perfectly fine. It was all in their response. You know, the kicks in John Wick, yeah, the gunshots, you know, that kick to the chest that everybody wants. It's in this house curve right here. It's in this 30 to 50 hertz range. That's where it's at. It's, you know, it, you need that extra output if you're not at reference. That's where all the fun is. So we want about 10 dB. So right here, we've got about 75. That's 83. I'm going to boost it up a little bit more. Uh, 84.7, close enough to 85. Okay. So that is our target. We are done with that. So now we're going to adjust our target, adjust this blue line, and get it onto our frequency response. So we're going to go ahead and raise it up a little bit. Now, uh, now uh, not Odyssey, but REW doesn't like to boost. It's going to do, it won't, you know, it'll cut, but it doesn't want to boost. So we're not going to bring our target really into the middle of the response. We're going to keep it kind of low. I'm not going to be doing any boosting under 18 hertz so this stuff down here I'm not worried about there's a couple little spots it may need to boost let's go ahead and try it at target level at 80 okay so let's go ahead and hit filter task now here is the range that we're going to EQ I've got it set for 18 to 105 individual max boost that's how much any particular one filter will be boosted so it's limited to five overall that's you know combination of all your filters can be no more than 10 now it is limited to 12. So this flatness target defaults at three. I set it for one. That's how close it's gonna try to hug that response. So let's go ahead and hit match response to target. All right, and you see how tight that is? This is what it predicts it's gonna be able to do. Now I don't like what it's doing around here at 80. Hertz, so I'm going to go ahead and drop it down a little more. If you just wiggle that target up and down some, it'll eventually get you what you want. It's a little quirky. Okay, now I finally got a target that I like a lot. I went ahead and kind of adjusted a little bit. Now you, like I said, you kind of play with it. I brought it out to 15. Now I am going to be putting a filter down here. So now we're ready to save our filter. So if you have the mini DSP, you're going to come down here. Or if you had, have any of the supported EQs, you're going to come down here and hit Save Filter Coefficients to File. And you're just going to save it. So we're going to save this one as 13. I've got a lot. You know what? Let's not do 13. That's not a lucky number. Let's do 14. We want to be lucky. So... We have saved our filter file. We're ready to load it onto our mini DSP. Now, if you don't have a mini DSP or something to support it, say you have an iNuke, you have to come over here to EQ filters. And there's all the filters you have to load. So we have seven filters. And you have to load these on every one of the outputs of the mini DSP. Here's our frequency, here's our gain, and here's our Q. Our Q is the width of each filter. So you have to load each one of these to every channel. So if I have four subs right here, you know, four times seven is 28. So I have 28 filters to load. Now, 
especially with the iNukes and even the standard Mini DSP, you're going to have to do a lot of manual massaging after you load the filter. It's uh, usually this HD is going to be good. Once we load this filter file, we're going to be good to go. We don't even have to touch it up. Well, we may, maybe one or two spots, but very rarely. With the other ones, the Mini the Behringer, you're going to have to massage it. So you may or may not have enough uh, filters left over for that. You may have to come up here and kind of start working on some of these that you had to manually load or live with some, you know, bumps and stuff you don't want. And then if you don't like the EQ at all, sometimes, you know, REW, even though it gives you these filters, it'll throw something weird in the response that wasn't predicted. So you have to go load them again. You know, you have to create some new filters and try again. So, you know, you have already loaded 28 filters and now you're doing 56 because you had to just do it twice. So that's the main reason I like any DSP versus the Behringer uh, because of it's so easy to use, especially for new guys, you know, when you're learning, you do not want to have to fiddle with that because all we're going to have to do with the mini DSP is load a file. So we're going to come over here and we're going to go into outputs. All right, you're going to go to PEQ. Now you're probably going to be in basic mode, so make sure you click advanced mode, okay? And then you're going to come over here and you're going to hit import. And wherever you save that file, you need to go find it. So that was 14. There's our filters. Okay, and we are linked to channel 2, and there they are. Okay, let's go to channel 3, import, 14. And they're in, there they are in channel 4 as well. Alright, so let's go ahead and measure and see how it looks. Alright, so we are, we are done. And as you see, it's basically auto EQ. You just go into the EQ, set your target, and uh, get your filters and then you load them so it's quick and easy now if you do not get the response that it predicted you know if it's got some little squirrels in it somewhere that wasn't in the predicted on the EQ all you have to do is go over here to EQ change a few parameters kind of work you know move your um, your target around a little bit get a new set of filters and then try again so uh, you know but if if you have the mini DSP, it's no big deal. You're just loading a file. I mean, you can do that with less than a minute. You can get those new filters and have them loaded. So, now we need to set a high-pass filter because we do not want this thing producing any output under tuning frequency because we don't want our driver flapping around like a fish out of water because it has no protection under tuning frequency. This is assuming you have a ported sub or a ported subs. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the mini DSP. Oh, I just opened it. Uh, what, okay. All right, and before we go on, up here you have different configurations. These are where you can set different house curves, like we just put a house curve in on configuration one. If we wanted something else on configuration two, we could. If you want a little more boosting, you know, for maybe when you're listening louder or not as not as loud or listening to different music genre. Or whatever and you have that remote that was five dollars I think you know you can select between these on the fly which is pretty cool alright so we are gonna go to the crossover section now when you hear people talk about you know like say a full Marty and my subs aren't full Marty's I've been designing subs for 20 years these are mine even though they are similar mine are tuned at 17 Hertz so you'll hear people say you know well if you have this sub you need to set a filter at 20 Hertz so people come in here and they'll put 20 Hertz now I've already been in here I think this one uh, is going to default to 24 dB per octave okay so that's what you're going to get you set a filter at 20 Hertz that's the default 24 dB per octave and it starts dropping right here which is 30 Hertz you're not dropping at 20 or it's not starting to drop at 20 you know, at 20 over here, we've lost negative 3, we've lost a lot of output, you know, for no reason. So, what I always suggest you do is set a really steep filter. So, let's go ahead and go down a little bit. 
set of 48 db see how steep that is now but it's still dropping early you know now it's dropping at like 23 24 so we're going to drop it down because i want it to start dropping you know 18 hertz or so i want i want it falling like a rock so i'm going to set it for 15 let's see what it looks like okay that's right around there 17 hertz yeah, that's pretty good uh, you know what i'm going to go up a little bit and set it for 16. okay all right so yeah 18 19 hertz i'm dropping off so that's that's what i want all right so i'm output uh linked to output two so output two is also done so let's go to three and set that for 16. as you see i've already been on here so that's why some of this stuff is already set five has okay now this right here is not going to matter i mean that's way up but i'm going to go ahead and bypass that just so it's a nice straight line but our sub's going to be in this area here and we are set we can go ahead and just double check on four we're all good to go all right so let's go ahead and measure it and see what it looks like All right, there we are. So you see at just under 20 hertz, we start dropping. Let's go ahead and adjust our limits just so we can see it down a little bit lower than 15. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's dropping good. And that's what we want. We do not want our sub trying to play those frequencies below tuning. So, and also I don't really like those low frequencies too much. So for me, that's just icing on the cake. All right, so let's say we wanted to do some manual EQ on the Mini DSP, which you may need to do. So like, like right here, we have a little bitty hump. Actually, we don't really have a hump. Hmm. Let's work on this little dip. Let's see if we can bring this dip up a little. It's at 21 and a half. Uh, let's try 22. It's kind of in the middle. You can't do decimal points in mini DSP unfortunately so we're gonna call it 22 just to for demonstration purposes so manual EQ you're gonna do on inputs input side okay we're gonna hit PEQ now if you notice you're in basic mode not advanced in advanced mode that's where we loaded the filter files on the output side and you know we had four different outputs because we're using four subs in this room now in the input the good thing about this is we can affect all of our subs in this one window right here. So it makes it much easier without having to go to every output. And that's why I had you load your filter files on the output and not the input side. All right, so we have different filter, we have a bunch of different tabs here EQ1, 2, 3. These are our filter tabs. So we can load up to 10 filters. So I think uh, 22 hertz was where we were going to touch that response up. So this is our frequency and here's our gain. We're going to do a little boosting. Let's go ahead and boost it half a dB. All right, now I'm going to boost a little more just so you can see the see it there. Oh, we're bypassed. Okay. There we go. Now, you see that little hump? We're going to bring it back down. And this is our Q. This is the width of the filter. See it's getting getting wider so we want a nice little sharp you know it was a very very small little hump so we're going to bring it back down to like eight or so that's good and gain a 0.5 let's go look at that okay So, and that's our new response. They both look good, really. I mean, it's kind of, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference audibly, audibly between either one of those. So that's how you do it, right there. Eh. I really wish it would let you do 
between the two points because I really need to scoot that over to 21.5, but it is what it is. All right, so I'm going to go back in here and bypass it. Now, if we wanted to do another filter somewhere else, let's go ahead and unbypass it so you can see them both. We go to EQ2 over here and, you know, see this one's bypassed too. I was in here screwing around earlier. See, now we have two filters, a little bitty one there, and we've got one here. So you can have as many as you, well, you can have up to 10 if you needed them. All right. Let's bypass all those, and now we're back to what we had before. All right, now that response has no smoothing on it. And you have to be careful when people show you their sub responses. A lot of times they'll smooth them, and that's cheating. We do not smooth sub responses. If you go up here to graph, you'll see smoothing options. Now, when you're showing a full range speaker, there's lots of reflections and interference in the room. So that's when you use smoothing is for full range measurements just so you have something readable. For sub measurements, we don't use smoothing and we always have a 5 dB per increment scale on the left because if we smooth this response, watch what happens. Boom. So, and that looks like, you know, perfect, of course, but a lot of times, you know, somebody will smooth it with 1.6 and it's still got some squiggles in it. It's just a... Uh, the mini DSP HD is so good and tight that it's it's just how it looks. So let's turn that back off and there's our raw response. We always want to see no smoothing on our subs. So let's go ahead and look at our seat to seat real quick. That is the main listening position. We're going to go ahead and move it over to the left. Let's get that measurement real quick. All right, very, very, very similar. Now I'm going to go all the way to the far left. And again, we're doing like we've been doing. We're kind of measuring the distance across a three-seat or cushion couch, three-seat couch. All right, now I'm going to move it over to, I'm going way over to the right. Now we're to the right of my, we're actually going to measure my seat. I haven't done it yet. All right, so this is the one I care about because this is my seat. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and measure the last seat. This is going to be the far right, about six feet from that far left measurement. This one's close to the opening, so it's probably not going to be quite as similar. All right, so there you go. That's all. That's what, five measurements across a three-seat sofa. That's a very, very tight response for seat-to-seat -seat consistency. All of the seats are basically hearing the same thing, so that's what we want to see. All right, guys, and this right here is why 80 hertz is a great point or a great crossover point because it's commonly accepted that 80 hertz is where subs are no longer localizable. You know, you can't really locate where the, the sound's coming from, you know, and above that it becomes localized. Now, if you have a bunch of subs around the room, you could probably even go higher than that and it not be localized. Maybe even 90 or 100 hertz is not localized. But the point is, you saw what happens when you have one source of modal frequencies or, you know, one source of bass. So if you've got your left main playing something at 60 hertz, you know that every seat is going to have a different experience because you only have one source of bass. So that's why you want to let the subs handle as much of the frequency response as you can. The more you can let it handle, the more you're going to be guaranteed a similar response at every seat. So if that makes sense, that's going to, you know, it should really click in your mind now why you don't want to have a low crossover point. You know, some people have it, you know, it sounds better at 40 hertz. 
Well, all that means is above 40 hertz, your frequency response is going to sound different in every seat because now you've got one source playing from 40 hertz and up. You know, so if that sounds better at 40 hertz, it's because your subs are jacked up. Basically, something is wrong with your subs because if your subs look like this right here, I can guarantee you, you know, from 80 hertz, if that's where I cross it, the subs are going to sound better than any speaker in the room because I'm going to have a similar response at all the seats that we're using or all the main seats that we, you know, that we measured right here. So that's definitely something else to think about. So don't forget to raise your crossover point. You know, we had it at 250 or whatever we went to to take these measurements. Don't forget to lower that back down. And you're also going to have to rerun your auto room correction because it's going to have to set, set your uh, sub distance again. Because remember, whenever we align these subs, we create a virtual sub in the room. It is moved around your room and who knows where it's at now. So you're going to have to run auto correction to align it. Now you can also verify because if you're out of phase, you're going to see usually a null or you will see nulls around the crossover point. Sometimes above it and below it, so kind of look at both sides. You know, if you cross at 80, go ahead and look out to maybe 140 and look at this whole area right here. You know, while your speaker set to small, so you can see that transition from main to sub and make sure that there's no nulls in there and make sure that the receiver set your sub distance correctly because sometimes it gets it wrong. Okay, so now that you've got your sub set up, you're ready to run Room Correction Odyssey or whatever you use. Now, we do not run, you know, Odyssey first and then do, you know, align subs. That wouldn't make any sense. Every time you re-ran Odyssey, you'd have to redo your subs. So, subs are done. So, we can run Odyssey or our room correction a hundred times and we never have to go back and touch our subs. Our subs are done unless we add a sub, move the seats or something like that. Then we have to go back and look at our sub just to make sure everything looks good. But anyway... When you get ready to run your room correction, one of the first things it's going to do, like Odyssey is going to do, is it's going to send pink noise to the sub, and it's going to give you a level on the screen. And it's going to tell you, now you may not even know if it's if it's intolerance, it may, it'll just skip it. But if it's not intolerance, it's going to tell you to adjust it. Now I've got four subs in here, so it, it always tells me to turn it down. Sub level is too high. So we've game matched our subs. And if you didn't game match your subs, you need to go back and uh, right before this, I put a link at the top to another video that shows you how to game match your subs because that's very important. So you can't go and individually adjust the subs and just turn them all down. You need to do it all at one place because remember we have to treat all of our subs as one unit. So you can go over here to inputs, and click right here, and just simply turn it down right here. Or if it tells you it's too low, you can bump it up right here. And that's it. Just do it. The, uh, it'll be like a live SPL reading on the screen, you know, if you're using Odyssey. And so you can see it in real time as you adjust it here. All right. So that's going to take care of that. Sorry, right, guys. Well, that's going to be, uh, you know, like I said, that's a wrap for this one. That's going to be it. So next episode will probably go over uh, just simple sub setup you know for the guys that don't want to get quite this uh complicated just just the basics and uh after that we may get into seating uh, room modes and stuff like that so if y'all i can also leave some comments down at the bottom on what you want to see next don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you're notified when the next video hits all right guys until next time i'm out of here